Good afternoon. So um, we uh, spent our last lecture laying out some of the basic foundations, making a couple of definitions. I want to quickly recap the most important concepts and definitions. And then, uh, let me be blunt, I kind of want to get through these definitions, which I think are, it's important to do them precisely. Um, but there's nothing significantly challenging about them. We just need to make sure they are defined very precisely. So now that you've kind of seen the style of these things, I would like to sort of move through the next batch of these definitions uh, quickly enough that we can start to move into more interesting material. So a quick recap, and my apologies, my daughter has some kind of a virus that I am desperately trying to make sure I do not catch. Um, and so I will be hydrating during this, uh, during this lecture. Um, so I just want to recap some of the most important concepts we went over. So this whole class is essentially a study in space-time. Okay, we're going to, later we're going to connect space-time to gravity, and general relativity is going to become the relativistic theory of gravity. So we began with a fairly mathematical definition. Space-time is a manifold of events that is endowed with a metric. Manifold, for our purposes, is essentially just a set in which we understand how different members of the set are connected to each other. Events are really just when and where something happens. Uh, we haven't precisely defined metric yet. We will soon, okay? But uh, intuitively disregard it as some kind of a mathematical object that gives me a notion of distance between these events. I was tried, and I will continue to try, to be very careful to make a distinction between geometric objects that live in the manifold, the events themselves, things like a displacement vector between two events, uh, other vectors, which I will recap the definition of in just a moment. They have an existence and sort of a reality to them that is deeper and more fundamental than uh, the representation of that object. Okay, so when I say that the displacement vector is delta x, delta, excuse me, delta t, delta x, delta y, delta z, that is according to observer O. And when I write that down, I will be very careful, as much as possible, I will occasionally screw this up, but I will try to write this down without using an equal sign. Okay, equal sign implies a degree of reality that I do not want to impart to that representation. So an equal dot with a little O here, that's my personal notation for delta x is represented by these components according to observer O. And for shorthand, I will sometimes just write this by the collection of indices delta x alpha. Uh, a different observer, O bar, will represent their, th they will uh, represent this, this vector using, it's the exact same geometric object. They all agree that it's this displacement between two physical events in space time. But they assign different coordinates to it. They give a different representation to it. And we find that representation using a Lorentz transformation, okay? And I'm not going to write out explicitly the Lorentz transformation matrix lambda. I gave it in the last lecture, and I'm assuming you're all experts in special relativity, and I don't need to go over that. So I will then, using this as sort of the prototype, the general notion of a vector in space-time, which we'll often call a four vector, for the obvious reason that it has four components, um, I'm going to treat that as any quartet of numbers that has transformation properties just like the displacement vector that I just went over. So if there's some quantity A that has a time like an X, a Y, and a Z component, as long as a different observer, for reasons having to do with the underlying physics of whatever the heck this A is, as long as that different observer relates their components to observer O's components via the Lorentz transformation, you got yourself a four vector, okay? Any random set of four numbers, that ain't a four vector. Uh, you need to have some physics associated with it, and the physics has to tell it that it's a thing that's related by a Lorentz transformation. All right. <clears throat> so I want to pick up this discussion by introducing four particularly important and special vectors, uh, which, to be honest, we're not going to use too much beyond some of this, uh, the first couple weeks or so of the course, but they're very useful, and one should often bear in mind, even later in the course, and they've sort of disappeared, that they're kind of there coming along for the ride secretly. And these are basis vectors. Okay, so if I go into frame O, it's going to pick some particular reference frame. I can immediately write down four special vectors. So remember, this is a Cartesian type of coordinate system. So I'm going to introduce 
E0, I'm going to represent this by just the number 1 in the time-like slot and 0 everywhere else. E1, or Ex if you prefer, I'm going to write that down like so. Um, and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. OK. The analogy, if you've all seen unit vectors in other classes, hopefully this is fairly obvious what I'm doing. OK, I'm just picking out a set of you know, little dimensionless, simple quantities that point along the preferred directions that I've set up in this inertial reference frame. A compact way of writing this so notice I have four of these vectors, and these vectors each have four components. And so what I can say is that The beta component of unit vector E alpha is represented, according to observer O, by delta alpha beta, the Kronecker delta. Okay? Um, if you're not familiar with this one, I'm usually reluctant to send you to Wikipedia, but in this case, I'm going to send you to Wikipedia. <laughs> Wiki the uh, Kronecker delta. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so that, that kind of what that does is just emphasizes that at least in, by the way, I should put little O's underneath all of these things because I have chosen this according to observer O's representation. So this is just saying that according to observer O, these are four very special vectors. The utility of these things it's up high for everyone in the back to be able to see. Okay, the utility of doing this is that if I now want to write the vector a as a geometric object, I can combine the components that observer O uses with the basis vectors that observer O uses, and I can sum them all together. I can put them together, and then I've got the. It's not a representation. That's the damn vector. Okay, I put it all together using sort of an internally consistent set of numbers and basis vectors. And so I am free to say this, where I actually use an actual equal sign. Okay, you might stop and think, well, but those aren't the components that observer O bar is, it would use. And you're right. Observer O bar would not use those components. They would also not use those basis vectors. We're going to talk about how those things change. But observer O bar does agree that if they were handed O's components and O's basis vectors, this would give me a complete representation of what the vector is. Okay? So again, I'm really harping on this sort of distinction between the geometric object and the representation. This is the geometric object. And we can take advantage of this. Okay, the fact that that combination of things is the geometric object is a tool that I'm going to now, it's a fact that I'm going to exploit uh, in order to figure out how my basis vectors transform when I change reference frames. So let me just repeat what I wrote up there. Uh, but whoops. A good point for just a slight editorial comment. Um, when you're talking and writing and there are millions of little subscripts and indices, Sometimes the brain and the appendages get out of sync with one another. I caught that one. I don't always, OK? So if you see something like that and you kind of go, um, why did that alpha magically turn into a beta? It's probably a mistake. Please call it out, OK? All right. So uh, this is how I, I, I build this geometric object. 
using the components and the basis vectors as measured by O, as used by observer O, let's now write out what they would be if they were measured by a different observer, an O bar observer. Okay? I know how to get components, the barred components, from the unbarred components. I don't yet know how to get the unbarred base, excuse me, the barred basis vectors from the unbarred basis vectors. But I know that whatever, they exist. And that once I know what they are, this equation is true. Okay? These are just two different ways of writing this geometric object, which every observer agrees has this existence that transcends the representation. So let's rewrite what I've got on the right-hand side of the, the rightmost equal sign here. I'm going to write this as lambda mu bar beta a beta. Bar. Um, and then now I'm going to use a trick, which is what the, it's not even so much a trick, but just going to use a fact that is great when you're working in index notation. Okay, so often when students first encounter this kind of notation, your instinct is to try to write everything out using matrices and things like row vectors and column vectors. Okay, it's a natural thing to do. I urge you to get over that. Um, if I get some bandwidth for that, I'm going to write up a set of notes this weekend showing how one can translate at least two by two objects and one, two index objects and one index objects in a consistent way between uh, uh, matrices and row vectors and column vectors. Um, but we're rapidly going to start getting into objects that are bigger than that for which trying to represent them in matrix-like form gets untenable. Okay, in a little while we're going to have a three index object. And since we don't have three-dimensional chalkboards, making the sort of matrix representation of that is challenging. Uh, soon after that, we'll have four index objects, and we'll occasionally need to take derivatives of that four index object, giving us a five index object. At that point, the ability to sort of treat them like matrices is hopeless. So really, you should just be thinking of this as ordinary multiplication of the numbers that are represented by these components as written out here. And an ordinary multiplication like this, I can swap the order of, uh, I can just go ahead and swap the order of um, multiplication very easily here. So what I'm going to do is move the, hang on just a second. Yeah, 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 now I see what I'm doing. Sorry about that, I misread my notes. I'm just going to move the A onto the other side of my lambda. Oops. And then I'm going to use the fact that beta on my right hand side is a dummy index. So in that final expression I wrote down over there, beta is a dummy index, and I'm free to adjust it to put it into a form that's more convenient for me. So let's begin. Let me just write where I've got this equation right now over there. E alpha, excuse me, A alpha, E alpha equals, and what I've got then is component A beta lambda mu bar beta, e, whoops, <laughs> E mu bar, sorry about that. So I'm going to remap my dummy index. The reason I did that is I can now move this to the other side and factor out the A alpha. 
OK, everyone can see that, I hope. So see what I did was I arranged this so that I've isolated essentially only the transformation of the basis vector. So this equation has to hold no matter what vector I am working with, right? It's got to hold for an arbitrary A alpha, so the only way that can happen This means that my transformation of basis vectors obeys a law that looks like this. Now, in first inspection, you look at it and you go, ah, that's exactly what we got for the components of the four vector. Caution. Let me remind you, it's actually on the board over there. OK? The barred component is playing a different role than the barred basis vector here. OK? If you want to get the barred basis vector from the unbarred basis vector, you need to work with the inverse of this matrix. That's what this is telling us here. OK? All that being said, if you're just working through this and you've got you know, your components uh, set up and you're sort of hacking through it, the algorithm for you to follow is actually simple. Really, all we're doing is lining up the indices. We're summing over the ones that are repeated and requiring that those that are on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side appear and equal one another. Or, as an old professor of mine liked to say, about 12 times a lecture, line up the indices. So that's essentially what we're doing, OK? In this case, I line up, you know, I've, if, if I have my Lorentz transformation matrix with the barred index up top and the unbarred down below, boom, I line up the indices and that tells me what the unbarred basis components are from the barred ones. And vice versa for the components. So with that basically, as I just said, that tells me if I actually want to get this guy, given this guy, I need to work with the inverse. Let me put this up high so that everyone in the back can see it. So this, again, is one of those places where you might be tempted to sort of write out a matrix and do a matrix inversion. But before you do that, remember this is physics, OK? The inverse is going to be, the inverse matrix is going to be the one that does at least for certain quantities, you know, what, 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 the, what the Lorentz transformation does, that it relates objects, if I'm at rest, if I consider myself at rest, it tells me about things according to a frame that is moving with respect to me. The inverse matrix does the opposite. It would say to that person being at rest, what, are the, what is the matrix that tells them about things according to me? And they see me moving with the exact same velocity, but in the opposite direction. So to get the inverse matrix, to get the inverse Lorentz transformation, What we end up doing is we just reverse the velocity. OK. So I have just wrote down for you. And it's worth bearing in mind, every one of these lambdas that is here, they are really functions, right? So my E alpha that I wrote down over there, I'm going to use an under tilde to denote a three vector. Okay? Uh, in many of your textbooks, it's written with a bold face, but that's hard to do on a blackboard. Okay, So if I want to go the other direction, well, I just need to have the, have the inverse transformation. Okay, And I have that. <coughs> 
bear in mind, I mean, those are really the exact same matrices, okay? In terms of the functions that I'm working with here, I'm just flipping around in directions in order to get these things out, okay? So, as I said, you might be tempted just to go ahead and do the matrix inversion. And let me just do a quick calculation to show you that that would work, okay? And the reason I'm doing this is I just want to quickly step through a, uh, a particular step which is again, sort of in the spirit of swatting mosquitoes with sledgehammers, it's the kind of analysis that you're going to sort of have to do off to the side now and again. So given that I know E alpha is, let's see, let's use beta. Now beta bar V E beta bar. But I now know that I could write this guy as lambda, let's use a gamma, beta bar minus v gamma direction. You now you look at that and you go, oh look, I'm actually summing over the betas there. Let's gather my terms a little bit differently. So notice I have unbarred basis vectors over here on the left, unbarred ones over here on the right, a bunch of junk in these braces here in the middle. The only way for that to work is if after summing over beta, that bunch of junk is in matrix language, we would say it's the identity matrix. Okay? In component notation, we're going to call it the Kronecker delta. Just as a little aside, uh, if I started with the barred on the left side and the unbarred on the right-hand side and did a similar analysis, it would take you at this point, now that you are all fully expert in this kind of index manipulation, it should take you no more than about a minute to demonstrate to yourself that you can get a Kronecker delta on the barred indices uh, in a similar way, just by using them in a slightly different order. Okay? All right. So far, all still basically just formalism. So I'm going to start now doing a little bit of formalism that will very quickly sag into physics. We can all take a deep sigh of relief and go, ah, okay, something you can imagine measuring, so that's nice. So. I have introduced four vectors. I have introduced the basis vectors and their components. I haven't really done anything with them yet. So before we start doing things with them, let's think about some operations that we can do with four vectors. So the first one, which I would like to introduce, is a scalar product. And to motivate the scalar product that I am going to define, in the same way that I defined four vectors as a quartet of numbers whose transformation properties are based on the transformation properties of the displacement, I'm going to motivate a general scalar product between four vectors by a similar uh, kind of quantity that is constructed from the displacement. So let me recall a, a result that I hope is familiar from special relativity. So working in units where the speed of light is 1, you are hopefully all familiar with the fact that this quantity, 
is something that is invariant to all observers. I, a, I did not use a represented by symbol there, because no matter who's delta t, delta x, delta y, delta z I use there, they will all agree on the delta s squared that comes out of this. Okay. If I want to, uh, actually, well, let me write a, a few things down before I say anything more. So this is an invariant. This is the same, uh, I should write it a slightly different way. It is the same in all Lorentz frames. So pick some observer, get their delta t, delta x, et cetera. Assemble delta S squared, pick a different observer, do the Lorentz transformation, assemble their delta T prime, delta X prime, uh, et cetera, make that, boom, they all agree. So we're going to use this to say, you know what, I'm going to call that the inner product of the displacement vector with itself. So I'm going to call this delta x dotted into delta x, OK? And so what this means is that built into my scalar product, so if I write this as a particular observer would compute it, This is the scalar product that I'm going to define with respect to the displacement vector. And this is usually the point where somebody in the class is thinking, why is there a minus sign in front of the time-like piece? I can't answer that. <laughs> All I can say is that appears to be, more than appears to be, there's a whole freaking buttload of evidence. It's not how nature is assembled. Okay, it's connected to the fact, so the fact that all of my spatial directions are sort of entering at the same sign, but my time light direction is moving, it has a different sign. It's connected to the fact that I can easily move left and right, front and back. Uh, it's a little bit of effort. I can move up and down. But I cannot say, oh, crap, I left my phone at home. I'll go back 15 minutes and pick it up, right? You cannot move back and forth in time. Time actually, which is the time light component of this thing, it enters into the geometry in a fundamentally different way from the spatial things, and that's reflected in that minus sign. Anything deeper than that, um, let's just say that uh, we're probably not likely to get very far with that conversation. Depending on what kind of muscle relaxants you enjoy using on the weekend, you might have some fun conversations about it, but it is not something that uh, you're really going to get very far with. You just kind of have to accept it. It's part of the built-in geometry of nature. OK, so this I am defining as the inner product with the, of the displacement vector with itself. I define vectors as having the same transformation properties as the displacement vector. can similarly define an inner product of a four vector with itself. And I'll put this on a, another board. going to define this, or rather I will say it is represented according to observer O as minus a 0 squared plus a 1 squared plus a 2 squared plus a 3 squared. 
I realize there can be a little bit of ambiguity in the way I'm writing it here. Uh, you just have to, you know, if you're ever confused, just ask for clarification about whether I'm raising something to a power or whether it's, a, it's an index label. Context usually makes it clear. Handwriting sometimes obscures uh, ha um, context, though. The reason why I'm doing this, and a real benefit of this, <coughs> is that whatever this quantity is, because A has the same transformation properties of the displacement, this must be a Lorentz invariant as well. Okay, the underlying mathematics of Lorentz transformation doesn't care that I wrote A0 instead of delta x0. It doesn't care that I wrote A1 instead of delta x1, et cetera. Okay, it just knows that it's a thing that goes into that slot of the Lorentz transformation. So all observers, this is how I represent it according to observer O, but all observers agree on that form. Um, and as a consequence, this is going to be something that we exploit a lot. Okay, even when we move beyond the sort of the simple geometry of special relativity, a generalization of this will be extremely important for not an exaggeration to say everything. So a little bit of terminology. So if A dot A is negative, and depending upon which is bigger, A0 squared or the sum of the other ones could very well be negative, we say that A is a time-like vector. Okay, this traces back to the fact that if A were the displacement vector, if the displacement, the invariant interval were negative, that would tell me that the two events, which are the beginning and the end of the interval, I could find a frame at which they are at the exact same location and are only separated in time. Okay? In the same way, this is basically saying that I can find a frame where this vector points parallel to observer, some observer's time axis. If this is positive, A is space-like. Everything I just said about time-like, lather, rinse, repeat, but replace time with space, okay? And if a dot a equals zero, we say a is, there's two words that are commonly used, light-like or null. Null just traces back, obviously, to the zero. Light-like is because this is a vector that could lie tangent to the trajectory that a light beam follows in, spa in space time. Okay. Okay, let me get some clean chalk. So, so far I've only talked about this inner product, this scalar product. Oh, and by the way, so this, we will often, I'll use inner product and scalar product um, somewhat interchangeably, but this allows me to reiterate a point I made in Tuesday's lecture. When I say scalar, scalar refers to a quantity which is, you know, it doesn't have any components associated with it, so in that sense it's familiar from your, your intuition of, you know, not a vector. Uh, but it has a deeper meaning in this course because I also want it to be something that is invariant between reference frames. So A dot A is the scalar product. It gives me a quantity that all observers agree on. Now, I've only done scalar products of vectors, A and the displacement vector, with themselves. So a more general notion if I have vectors A and B, then I will define the inner product between them as observed by O, as constructed by observer O, rather, like so. Okay? It's not hard to convince yourself, given everything we've done so far, that this quantity must also be invariant. I'll sketch a really quick proof. 
let's define, let's say we have two four vectors, a and b. Their sum by the linearity rules that apply to these vectors must also be a vector. And so if I compute c dot c, this is an invariant with a little bit of a little bit of labor that basically boils down to middle school algebra. You can show that c dot c is a dot a plus b dot b plus twice a dot b. This is invariant. This is invariant. This is invariant. And so this must be invariant. So this is really useful for us, OK? Because we now have a way. You know, we, I've, I've introduced these objects, these geometric objects, these four vectors. We are going to use them uh, in this class to describe quantities that are of interest to the physicist who wants to make measurements in space time. We've now learned, you know, one, one of the things when you're doing stuff in relativity is you have to be careful. Who is measuring what, OK? What are the components of that four vector as seen by this observer? What about their friend who's jogging through the room at 3 quarters of the speed of light? What about their friend who's jogging at 2 thirds of the speed of light in the other direction? You, know, you have all these really annoying calculations that you can and sometimes have to do. This gives us a way to get certain things that are invariant out of the situation that everyone is going to agree on. Invariants are our friends. So earlier today, Earlier in today's lecture, I talked about how I can write my four vectors using the basis vectors. So another way of writing this, so no, what's sort of annoying is every time I've actually written out the inner product, I have used the represented by symbol. I don't want that. I want to have equal symbols in there, damn it. So let's take advantage of the fact that a dot b, I know how to expand a and B using components and basis vectors. And again, using the index notation, I can just pull everything out and rearrange this a little bit. Whenever you get down to a point like this, we now get to do what every mathematician loves to do. Give something a name. I'm going to define the inner product of basis vector A with basis vector B to be a two-index tensor, eta, alpha, beta. What's lovely about this is this is a totally frame invariant quantity. We know that. And so I've now found a way to write this using the components as something that gives me a result that is totally frame invariant. Now, when you hack through a little bit of the algebra of this, what you'll find is that the components of this metric, oh, shoot, I didn't want to actually say it out loud. Uh, the components of this tensor, which I will pretend you didn't hear me say that, the components of this tensor has the following components. <sighs> I just said something circular. Has the following values. This is, as I uh, unfortunately gave away the plot, this is, in fact, the metric that I said at the beginning is the quantity that I must associate with space time in order for there to be a notion of distance between events. I haven't really said what a tensor is carefully yet. I'm going to make a more formal definition of this in just a moment. But this is your first example of one. Okay, And so the way in which this actually gives me a notion of distance is through this that I wrote down right here. Okay, If I have two events in space time that are separated by a displacement delta x, Delta S squared, which I obtained from this thing, 
is fundamentally the notion of distance between those two events that I use. And notice, it's a little less normal of a distance than you're used to when you do sort of ordinary Euclidean geometry. This is a distance whose square can be negative. Okay, what we like to say is that when you're working in special relativity, you know, that the, these are not, it's not necessarily positive, the distance between two events is not necessarily, or the distance squared is not necessarily positive definite. Okay? Um, if it's negative, though, that just means, you know, it's sort of dominated by the time interval between them. Okay? If it's positive, you know it's dominated by the space interval between them. If it's zero, well, you actually know, you, you, it's actually a little bit confusing at that point. They could be, in fact, you know, very widely separated in both space and time, but in such a way that a light beam could connect them. Okay, so there's a lot of information encoded in that. Now, as we move forward, hang on a second. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to upgrade this. Okay, so right now our metric is just this simple matrix of minus ones, zeros, and ones. One of the things that uh, we're going to do is sort of a, 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 a warm-up exercise. So the more complicated things we're going to do later is we're going to move away from special relativity and Cartesian coordinates. We're going to look at it in polar coordinates. That's going to be kind of like a warm-up zone. And so when we do that, this, we're always going to reserve eta for the, uh, the metric of special relativity when I'm working in Cartesian coordinates. Okay? It's, just, it's a great symbol to have for that, and it's a, it's a useful thing to always have that definition in mind. I can continue to do special relativity, but then working in co coordinates that are you know, spherical-like or polar-like or something like that. Then this is going to become a function. Okay? And what that is going to mean is that things like my little basis vectors are going to have more complicated behavior. Uh, a little later in the course, we will then show that when gravity enters into the picture, essentially the essence of gravity is going to be encoded in this thing as well um, in a way where, again, it's going to be a function. It's going to vary as a function of space and time and the dynamics of gravity will be buried in that. Sort of funny that it really does just sort of start out. I mean, if, if, if you take that thing and you set delta t equals 0, this is just the bloody Pythagorean theorem. Okay? That is all this is. Um, put time back in, and it sort of is the generalization of Pythagoras to space time. And in fact, we're going to take advantage of that and sort of define a geometry that looks like this as being flat in the same way that a board is flat, and the Pythagorean theorem works perfectly on it. Then we're going to start thinking about what happens when it becomes curved. And you start thinking about things like, what does the geometry on the surface of a sphere look like? Okay, That's just sort of pointing ahead. So I just throw that at you so that you get ready for some of the concepts that we will uh, we'll be talking about soon. So let me write this actually in terms of differentials, sort of useful for what I want to say next. So a little. Differential, if I have two events in space-time that are very close to one another, um, I can write them like so. And what I've essentially done here is written dx as dx alpha e alpha. Uh, before I get into some more sort of a couple of important, physically important four vectors, the reason I did this is I want to make an important point about some notation and f uh, uh, terminology that is used. If it is the case that the displacement vector is related to the differentials of your coordinates like so, we say that E alpha is a coordinate basis vector. What it does is it transforms a differential of your coordinate into a differential of a, a differential vector in spacetime. Now you may be thinking to yourself, okay, well what other kind can there be? Well, this is where my little spiel there a second ago about how we're going to start looking at more complicated 
uh, complicated things, it's going to become important. So when we're working in a Cartesian-like coordinate system, the fact that this is what we call a coordinate basis vector isn't very interesting. Suppose I was working in some kind of a curvilinear coordinate system, OK? Spherical coordinates. And let's just focus on three space for a second. So if I write out a sort of analogous equation in curvilinear coordinates, OK, so here's the three space version of that. And let's imagine that i equals 1 corresponds to radius, i equals 2 is theta, i equals 3 is phi. Then this would be dr er plus d theta e theta plus d phi e phi. that disturb you at all? OK. This has the dimensions of length. These have the dimensions of, of angle. In order for this to work, e r must be dimensionless. e theta must have the dimensions of length. e phi must have the dimensions of length. This is the form of a base. This is what a coordinate basis looks like when I am dealing with uh, well, well, we're going to use this a lot in this thing. So this is, I, I introduce this right now because you are all probably looking at that and some small part of you inside is weeping because what you want me to write down is this. Ah, isn't that better? Okay, this looks like something you're used to. So I throw this out here right now just because I want to make sure you're aware that there are some equations and some foundational stuff you guys have been doing over the years. Particularly, this shows up a lot when you've done e and M out of a textbook like Purcell or Griffiths or Jackson um, because there's some derivative operators which are assuming that your basis vectors are what we call orthonormal. So my EI hat here, it is an orthonormal basis. An orthonormal basis is defined such that the dot product of any two members of this thing gives me back the Kronecker delta. That is not necessarily the case when I work with a co coordinate basis. Our basis has er dot er equals 1. Yay, that one's nice. But when I do e theta dot e theta, I get r squared. E phi dot e phi will be r squared sine squared theta. And what I'm going to do when I start generalizing these things, I'm going to change my, you know, this, this thing which I defined up here. Let's see, I still have it on the board. Yeah, yeah, right here. So when I said eta alpha beta is e alpha dot e beta, and I made it this thing, I'm going to generalize this and say that the dot product of any two basis vectors, it gives me a more general notion of a metric tensor. And the values in the metric tensor may be functions like this. Okay. Right now, throw that out there. You know, this might be sort of like just like a peak of the horrors that lie ahead. Okay, we're not going to worry about this too much just yet, but I want you to be prepared for this. 
Uh, in particular, it's really useful to have this notion of a coordinate basis versus an orthonormal basis in your head. Okay? We're going to start defining some derivative operations soon. In fact, probably won't get to them today, but they will be present when we start doing uh, uh, lecture three. Um, and there's a couple results that come up where everyone's sort of like, wait, I knew that the divergence had a factor of r on that derivative there. Where would it go? Okay, it's because we're not working in an orthonormal basis. All right. I'm a little sick of math, so let's do a little physics. So, so far, the actual only physical four vector that I've introduced is the displacement vector. From the displacement vector, it's really easy to make you know, the, probably the first and simplest important four, vo uh, four vector, which is known as the four velocity. This tells me the rate of displacement of an observer as this person moves through space time per unit, and we're going to be careful about this in this class, d tau is the time interval as measured along the trajectory. of the observer with four velocity u. In other words, that's a very long-winded way of saying it, it's an interval of proper time. In English, the word proper time sounds very like, ooh, I don't want to use improper time. I better use that. But this actually, I think it comes from French. It just refers to the fact that it's one's own time. Um, apparently in German, people say Eigenzeit. So you know, there's a couple of different words for it. So, but proper time is what we use. Um, in special relativity, if we see someone going by with constant velocity, a particular observer who sees, you know, we're here in the room, someone comes through, their four velocity is u, we would see their four velocity to have the components gamma gamma v, okay? where gamma, I'll remind you, is the special relativistic Lorentz factor. And I'll remind you again, we've set speed of light to 1. A very useful thing, which we're actually going to take advantage of quite a bit, is that in the rest frame of u, In the rest frame of u, or I should say of the observer whose four velocity is u, okay, they just have one in the time like direction, c if you want to put your factors uh, back into there. And that's basically just saying that the person is standing still but moving through time. Okay, because you are always moving through time. All right, uh, from the four velocity, for an observer who has, or for an object, I should say, who has some mass, we can easily define the four momentum. Where this m is known as the rest mass of this object. Um, it's worth a, 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 a bit of uh, description here. You will often see, particularly in some older textbooks that discuss special relativity, people like to talk about the relativistic mass. Okay, and that comes from the fact that if I write out what this thing looks like, 
according to some particular observer, you have this gamma m entering into both of the components. And so older textbooks often call gamma m the relativistic mass. That's not really the way people have, uh, over the course of the past couple decades, they've moved away from that. And it's just more useful to focus on the rest mass as the only really meaningful mass, because as we'll see in a moment, it's a Lorentz invariant. Okay, we'll see what, how that is in literally about three minutes. Um, and so what we're instead going to say is that as seen by some particular observer, this has a time-like component that is the energy that that observer would measure and a, space, a set of space-like components that are the momentum that that observer will measure. So where we get a bit of important physics out of all this stuff is by coupling these two uh, four vectors to the scalar product that we made up. So the first one, if you do u dot u, according to any observer, that's just going to be minus gamma squared plus gamma squared v squared. And with about 20 seconds worth of analysis, you can find that this is always equal to minus 1. Actually, there's an even trickier way to do this. Suppose that I evaluate this in the rest frame of the observer whose forward velocity is u. Well, in the rest frame, v is 0 and gamma is 1, and I get minus 1. And this is an invariant. So whatever I get in that particular frame must be obtained in all frames. That's a trick we're going to use over and over and over again. Sometimes you can identify, you know, you get some kind of god-awful expression that just makes you want to vomit. But then you go, wait a minute. What would this look like in frame blah, blah, blah? And you sort of think about some particular frame. And in that frame, it may simplify. And if it does, and it's a frame invariant quantity, mazel tov, you have just you know, basically won the lottery. You've got this all taken care of. Go on with your life. So the four velocity has a scalar product of itself that is always minus 1, OK? How about the four momentum? Well, the four momentum is just four velocity times mass. That's just minus m squared. But we also know it's related to these two other quantities, which are important in physics. This is related to the energy and to the momentum. So this is also equal to minus e squared plus. So this is the uh, ordinary three, uh, uh, the, the magnitude of the three vector part of this thing, as measured by the observer who, uh, who, who breaks up the four momentum in this way. So what this means is I can manipulate this guy around a little bit here. Anybody who works in particle physics is presumably familiar with this equation. Sometimes it appears with the p squared moved on to the other side. Okay, if it looks a little bit uh, unfamiliar to you, let me put some factors of c back in this. So remember, we have set c equal to 1. When you put it back in, that's what this is. So it drops out of this in a very, very simple way. Um, one of the uses of this, and uh, many of you have done exercises, presumably in some previous study that does this, and there'll be a one exercise on uh, the PSAT that was just posted where you exploit this. So a key bit of physics, the reason why we care about four momentum is it's 
in one mathematical object allows us to combine conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So conservation of form momentum puts both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum into one mathematical object. So if I have n particles that interact, then the total form momentum is conserved in the interaction. OK? So um, yeah, we talk a little bit more about this and then just sort of quickly move on. So we com combining this with the fact that we are free to change our reference frames, often it gives us a trick that allows us to really simplify a lot of analyses. So if I have n particles that are sort of swarming around and doing some horrible, uh, horrible bit of business that I need to study and I need to have a good understanding of, we can often vastly simplify our algebra by choosing a special and very convenient frame of reference in which to do our analysis. Choose the center of momentum frame. So this is the frame in which that p tote, so c-o-m, center of momentum, has zero spatial momentum, OK? In that frame, you have just as much momentum going to the left as going to the right, just as much going forward as going backward, as much going up as going down. Um, and so this tends out to be so in the classic example of where this is really useful is when you are studying uh, particle collisions and you're looking at things like the production of new particles. So imagine you've got particle A with some form momentum PA coming in like this. Particle B has got some form momentum coming in like this. These guys collide. And they do so. I work in the center of momentum frame. I might want to just calculate the energy at which they just happen to produce some new pair of particles at rest. That would like define the threshold for this particular uh, creation process. Okay. So you're going to play with one problem on the piece that is kind of like that. Let's see. What do I have time to do? I think I will do, yeah, I think I can do two more things. So all the dot products that I have been talking about so far, have been uh, a dot product of a four vector with itself. Okay, I did u dotted into u, I did p dotted into p, I invented a frame in which p has a particularly simple form, and then when you actually do some the analysis, you would probably take that p tote and dot it into itself. I haven't done anything that looks at you know, the crossing between these two things, okay, dotting one into the other. So let me go through a very useful result that follows by combining P with U. I'm going to their very specific notion of P and a very specific notion of U. So let's let P be the form momentum of a particle, I'll call it A. Okay. 
let's let u be the four velocity, not of a, but the four velocity of observer o. Okay, so particle A might be a muon that was created in the upper atmosphere and is crashing through our room right now. Observer O might be your hyperactive friend who is jogging through the room at half the speed of light. Question I want to ask is what does O measure as the energy of particle A? So the naive way to do this, which I will emphasize, is not wrong. Okay? What you might do is sort of go, ugh, okay, well, we're sitting here. This room is our laboratory. I've measured this thing in my lab, so I know P as I measure it. I can see O jogging by, so I know O's four velocity as I measure it. So what I should do is figure out the Lorentz transformation that takes me into the rest frame of O. Uh, once I have that Lorentz transformation, I'll, do, I'll apply that Lorentz transformation to the four vector p. Boom, that will give me that energy. Okay? That will work. That will absolutely work. Um, but there's an easier way to do it. So one thing you should note is that everybody represents that four velocity as an energy, I mean, they represent the four momentum as an energy and a three momentum. In particular, though, they represent it as the energy that they would measure and the four momentum, excuse me, the three momentum that they would measure. So that means P, as seen by O, is E according to O and p according to o. That e according to o is what we want. And I just told you a moment ago, you know, if you have p in your own reference frame and you have u in your own reference frame, you can do this whole math with Lorentz transformations and get it out. But you also know that in o's own reference frame, o represents their four velocity as one in the time light direction, zero in the spatial direction. So what this means is if I go into O's reference frame, if I go into their inertial reference frame, Notice that if I take the dot product of p and u, I get e times 1 and p times 0. So that is just negative. It's exactly, you know, it's exactly what I want, modulo a minus sign. And so you go, OK, well, I'll flip my minus sign around. And you think, OK, great, but that's, you know, I did that using those quantities as written down in O's reference frame. And then you go, holy crap, that's an invariant scalar product. I'm done. Mic drop, leave the room. What this means is you start with P as you measure it, U as you measure it, take the scalar product between the two of them, boom, the answer you want pops out. No nonsense with Lorentz transformations, none of that garbage needs to happen. You just take that inner product and you've got it.
sort of says in words, you know, no matter what representation you choose to write down P and U in, take the dot product between the two of them, throw in a minus sign, you've got the energy of the particle with P as measured by the observer with U. Um, this is, it's, it's sort of late in the hour, um, the hour and a half, I should say. So let me just sort of emphasize, there are occasional moments in this class where if you're dozing off a little bit, I suggest you pop up and tattoo this into a neuron somewhere. This is one of those moments, okay? This is a result that we're going to use over and over and over again because this holds, this isn't just in special relativity, okay? We are actually, when we start talking about uh, the behavior of things near black holes, there's going to be a place where I basically at that point to say, well, I'm just going to use the fact that the observer measures an energy that is given by, and I'm going to write down that, okay? The dot product that's involved is a little bit more complicated because my metric is hairier, but it's the exact same physical concept, okay? Let me just do one more, and then I'm going to talk without getting into the math about what I will start with on Tuesday. Uh, last four velocity, which is probably useful for us to quickly talk about. Is, um, so we've been doing, we've, we've talked a lot about four velocity. That is just one piece. When we're talking about sort of the kinematics of bodies moving in space time, you need more information than just velocity. Sometimes things are moving around. There's additional, uh, additional forces acting on them. And so we also care about the four acceleration. So this is what I get when I take the derivative with respect to proper time of the four velocity. Okay, so there will be some homework exercises that use this. The main thing which I want to emphasize to sort of conclude our calculations for today is that when I talk about a four velocity of acceleration, this has an extremely important property. It is always the case. that A dotted into U equals zero. If you're used to sort of three-dimensional intuition, that may seem weird, okay? Anytime you see a car accelerate from a stop, that's a case in which its acceleration is clearly not orthogonal to its velocity, okay? But the issue here is, this is not a spatial dot product. This is a space-time dot product. And some of your intuition has to go out the window because of that. It's very simple to prove this. Remember, u dot u equals minus 1. So d of u dot u, d tau, which is just 2, u dot a is the derivative of minus 1, <laughs> which is 0. So we're, this is something that we will exploit. If you want to describe uh, the relativistic kinematics of an accelerating body, this is a great uh, thing that we can use to exploit. You often need a little bit more information. Okay? We have to give you as a bit of additional information, some knowledge about what the orientation of the acceleration is and things like that. Okay? So there are, whenever you are given, give me just a second, whenever you're given any kind of differential quantity like this, it's not enough to know like, the acceleration of velocity. You have to also have boundary conditions. Okay? And that sort of tells you like, what the initial direction is. Question? Uh, is that time still the proper time? That time is the proper time, yes. So it's like acceleration. So That's right. So you can still define a proper time for an accelerating observer. It will not relate. Hold that thought. You're going to play with this a little bit more on a future problem set. I mean, the, the, the key thing is that the way, if you have an accelerated observer, an interval of proper time as compared to an interval of time for you know, someone in a rest frame that sees this person accelerate away, the, the, the conversion between the intervals of time the two measure, it evolves. Okay? So you know, let's say you're in this room uh, with me. In fact, it turns out that if you accelerate at 1g for a year, you get to very close to the speed of light. Okay? So let's say that you were in a rocket ship right now that launched at, uh, with an acceleration of g. Initially, you and I um, synchronize our watches. And so an interval of a second to me is the same as a second to you. 
half a year later, you're moving at something like half the speed of light, and I will see a noticeable time delay. Your interval, of, an interval of a second as you measure it, looks long compared to me. Uh, a year, you know, six months later, you're actually quite close to the speed of light, and it gets dilated even more. Okay. So last thing which I'm going to say, and I'm not going to get into too much detail with this yet, is uh, we're going to begin next time by making a little bit more formal some of the notions that go around. So we've, we just talked about, we've introduced some physics and some vectors. I've given you guys one tensor so far, the metric tensor. So I'm going to give you, in fact, I, I will write down a very precise definition of this right now, and we'll pick it up from there on Tuesday. Basic idea, so you guys have seen, the one tensor you've seen so far is the metric tensor. And what the metric is, is it's sort of a mathematical object that I put in a pair of four vectors, and it spits out a quantity that is a Lorentz invariant scalar, okay, that characterizes what we call the inner product of those two four vectors. More generally, I'm going to define a tensor of type 0, n, as a function or mapping of n four vectors into Lorentz invariant scalars. which is linear in each of its n arguments. So I will pick it up here on Tuesday. I'm going to say in words, the metric is a 0, 2 tensor. I put in two four vectors, it spits out a Lorentz invariant scalar. We're going to, before too long, uh, come up with a couple of things that involve three real vectors, excuse me, three four vectors, <laughs> too many numbers here, a trio of four vectors, which it then maps to a Lorentz invariant scalar. Some of them will take in four four vectors and produce a Lorentz invariant scalar. Notice I wrote this in a sort of funny way. The zero n sort of begs for there to be sort of a n zero. Okay. To do that, I have to introduce a dual, an object that is sort of dual to a vector. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Those are objects called one forms, which actually happen to be a species of vector. We're actually going to then learn that the vector is itself a tensor. And so we will make a very general classification of these things, and we'll see that vectors are just a subset of these tensors. And uh, at last, we'll sort of have all the mathematics in place. We can sort of lose some of these distinctions and just life goes on. And we can start actually doing some physics with these. All right, I will pick it up there on Tuesday.